This is Peter Entrop with a history of reperfusion therapy for acute myocardial infarction published in the American Heart Journal in 2015. Reperfusion therapy for acute myocardial infarction began in 1958 when Saul Sherry's group attempted to restore blood flow in their feasibility study of intravenous streptokinase. But six major misconceptions derailed acceptance of reperfusion for more than 20 years. Reperfusion using fibrinolytic therapy was soon abandoned because cardiologists no longer attributed myocardial infarction to coronary thrombosis. They believed that thrombosis is a secondary event. Reperfusion by emergent aortocoronary bypass surgery, pioneered in 1968 by Favoloro and his colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, remained controversial throughout the 1970s. Because of the misconception that hemorrhage into reperfused myocardium would result in infarct extension with increased mortality. Attempts to use drugs to limit infarct size without reperfusion dominated the 1970s. More than 50 of these anti-infarct drugs were tested. None was ever approved as an anti-infarct agent. As late as 1979, the benefit of streptokinase therapy was attributed to reduction of myocardial oxygen demand and improvement of the microcirculation, but not reperfusion. Coronary vasospasm was hypothesized to be the central mechanism in the pathogenesis of acute infarction. Myocyte necrosis was thought to begin more than six hours after coronary occlusion and progress laterally in transmural concentric rings in a bullseye pattern over a period of 24 hours. Myocardial salvage was believed to be possible for at least 18 hours after symptom onset. These misconceptions unraveled in the late 1970s. In dogs, myocardial necrosis was shown to progress in a transmural direction, beginning with a subendocardium as a wavefront, not in a bullseye pattern. Rather than beginning six hours after coronary occlusion, myocardial necrosis was nearly complete at six hours in dogs. In humans, acute angiography before emergent bypass surgery documented the high incidence of total coronary occlusion in the first hours of myocardial infarction. A proof-of-concept study performed in Göttingen, Germany in 1978 demonstrated that mechanical transcatheter intervention could achieve early reperfusion and preserve function. The first case of transcatheter recanalization in a patient with acute ST elevation infarct shows a catheter touching the LED occlusion, which is repeatedly crossed with a guide wire. Reflow is established. Five months later, the lumen has improved due to endogenous lysis. The pathogenetic role of coronary thrombosis was definitively established in 1979 in another trial performed in Göttingen, demonstrating that most occluded infarct arteries were recanalized with intercoronary streptokinase, but not with intercoronary nitroglycerin. The first report of the pathogenetic role of coronary thrombosis was rejected for the March meeting of the American College of Cardiology in 1980. This scientific session was the last to exclusively feature drugs in the absence of reperfusion. A series of publications from Göttingen and subsequently New York City initiated a reassessment of thrombosis and reperfusion in acute infarction. The GC trial, which in 1986 documented the survival benefit of intravenous streptokinase administration, led to general acceptance of fibrinolytic therapy in STEMI. Primary PCI became the preferred reperfusion strategy after three trials published in 1993 documented superior clinical outcomes in comparison with intravenous fibrinolysis.